Hey guys, welcome to a new video. In the Quinergy project, we want to store energy either from, well, the sun or the grid to use it later. In the previous DC side of things video, I described we're going to be using some custom battery boxes for that, but one of the big components of those batteries or battery boxes are the battery cells. As you've likely guessed, we'll be using prismatic LIFEPO4 cells. So let's talk about that, including what I paid for them, how you should use them, and my experiences so far. First off, let's talk a little theory. Looking at terminology, you officially speak of a battery if all things are included, such as the connections and leads, a battery management system, so BMS, and well, everything like that. The main component of a battery, however, is a battery cell. Although one cell can form a battery, think about single AA alkaline batteries we use in a lot of things. In the energy storage world, generally a battery consists of multiple cells and the accompanying hardware. In our case, we're going to be using 16 times 280 amp hour cells in series to form a single battery or battery box. And then later we're going to be putting multiple of those in parallel to give us more capacity. The series connections of those 16 cells will give us the voltage we want. A single LIFEPO4 cell has a nominal voltage of about 3.2 volt. Charging voltage generally goes up to 3.65 although we'll take a closer look at that in later this video and in other videos. And discharge voltage is generally around 2.5 volt. Then you're going to get the most out of that battery cell. But 3.2 volt is a very low voltage to work with and would make it very impractical in regards to cables. Say you want to draw a thousand watt. With 3.2 volt, that is 312.5 amps, which means you'll need a huge diameter cable to transport that somewhere somewhat efficiently. By putting 16 cells in series, our nominal voltage raises from 3.2 volt per cell to 16 times that, which is 51.2 volt. Now transporting 1000 watt of power is only about 20 amps, and we can use much, much thinner cable to do so. The same also applies for all terminals and even PCBs inside of all the equipment. Uh, so running a higher voltage is important in that regard. But a higher voltage can also introduce some new dangers. But generally, currently 16 cells in series is considered a good compromise in both regards, especially with these LIFEPO4 cells. Just as a note, LIFEPO4 stands for lithium iron phosphate. It's just an acronym. Although the nominal voltage of a LIFEPO4 16S, that's what 16 cells in series is called, is 51.2 volt, it's generally considered to be a 48 volt battery. That's because the discharge voltage will generally be around 40 volt and a fully charged voltage around 56 to 58 volt. So you kind of pick a spot in the middle and for LIFEPO4 or LFP or lithium iron phosphate, as we'll see later on, that's right where the main capacity curve ends up being, around 48 volts. Right, let's immediately jump to that part and finish up with the theory behind this chemical composition and why we've chosen to use it. Using the Zetki ETEC A40L, as I've showed off in this previous video, it's easy to illustrate what I mean in regards to charged and discharged voltages. Here's a graph of charging and then discharging and then charging again a single LIFEPO4 280 amp hour cell. First, while charging with 40 amps, we see the voltage remain pretty constant until it sharply starts to rise until we reach the set limit of 3.6 volts. Right at that end, you see that we've reached the 3.6 volt and the amps start to decrease until it's lower than my set limit of 10 amps. This is also called a flow charge where voltage is constant, but the amperage, well, basically goes down until it's nothing. After waiting for about 30 minutes of real world time, we're now discharging the 40 amps. We see voltage quickly becoming 3.2 volt 
and then basically staying there as a sort of plateau. And it only slowly starts to taper off after that. You can see the time increasing at the bottom of the screen, and this is very much sped up footage. Let's take a quick look at this. Going from zero amp hours to over 200 amp hours drawn, the voltage delta has only been from 3.3 volt to 3.2 volt, which is a very small change. But nearing the 280 amp hour capacity, you see voltage starting to sag quicker and quicker until it completely falls away and the test automatically stops because it's below the threshold. And well, as I programmed it, after a quick little wait, we start charging again. We see the same pattern. It quickly rises in voltage to about 3.3 volt and then only climbs slowly right until the cell reaches saturation and then it spikes up. This is also the reason you don't really have to charge to 3.65 volts. You can charge it with like 3.6 or even 3.55 and then float charge the rest. So you don't have to use that high voltages, which in theory is better for the cell. You're basically shoving it in less fast. <laughs> Each battery chemistry has its own electrical properties though. And that's why you can parallel batteries with the same chemistry. It doesn't have to be the same ampere hours, but the same chemistry and behavior, but you should never mix multiple chemistries in a single setup. Right, so that's most of the technical stuff. Another reason for choosing LifePo4 over, for instance, lithium ion, which we're all familiar with, is because it's a very safe battery chemistry. You really have to mistreat it to make it gas out through the vent at the top of the batteries here. And well, especially if you want to treat a fire, you really have to over overcharge it and really misbehave, mistreat it. <laughs> sure, there is chemistry which is higher density, like lithium ion, for instance, but it's also more volatile. So a trade-off has to be made there in that sense. The last two advantages I wanted to mention is the price of LifePo4 in large energy storage quantities has become very affordable and that they are able to last for a lot of cycles. The cycle part is when you discharge and charge a battery again. Batteries can only keep their rated capacity for so many cycles before they basically start to show wear and can store less and less energy. For the chosen EVE 280 amp hour LF280K cells, this will be about 5,000 to 6,000 cycles, which is a lot. That's also the reason why I'm not going to compress the cells to get even more cycles, because I just don't think it's worth it. Say we're going to discharge all battery cells completely and recharge them again every single day. Doing so and only getting 5,000 cycles out of the cells, we're still talking three, or no, three, 13.6 years of usage like that. And that figure is based on the cells then only being able to hold 80% of their rated capacity. So basically these LiFePo4 cells will last decades in a home energy application. An important fact while keeping that in mind is again the price. Although lithium ion, for instance, might pack in more energy per square meter and might be cheaper to buy, I'm not sure that's still the case, but let's say it is per ampere hour per kilowatt hour or whatever, those cells generally only have 1000 cycles. So even if you pay, say, half for lithium ion, in 2.73 years, they will already only hold 80% of their capacity and will quickly start to drop off. So when we're comparing their usage over the next 15 years, you need, to, you need to take into account you'll have to buy new batteries at least four to five times versus the LifePo4 being able to buy once and use them for a very, very long time. Now, a lot of these things are, of course, a little bit more complicated when you dive into them and read all the papers, such as that, for instance, for some chemistries, you can charge them up to 80% and don't discharge them down to 20% and then they'll last twice as long, etc. But as a basic overview, this ex explains my choice of using LifePo4 cells, I think. <laughs> if you have a different opinion, please let me know in the comments. Right, so now that we know why I choose to use this type of cell in my batteries, let's take a look at the logistics and financial side. I've ordered these batteries from Shenzhen Luan Technology Co. Limited through Alibaba. 
After looking around for experiences and talking and comparing several vendors, I decided to go with them. Before that, I did a lot of research. I compared lots of different battery types and I made a whole sheet and comparing the price per watt hour and things like that, even different form factors and associated prices. But in the end, I stayed on the relatively safe side and decided to go with these Prismatic LF 280K cells. So I purchased 70 times new EVE 280 amp hour LF 280K cells of the B grade variety. For this, I paid $111 per cell and purchasing 70 cells meant a total amount of $7,700. Why purchase 70 cells when I only need 64 for four times 16? We'll get to that in a follow-up video, but let's just say I wanted to have some spares. To complete the costs, I also paid $1,265 to get them shipped to me by Sea Freight so I paid a total of $8,965, which does also include all import taxes and such associated things. That brings the grand total per cell to $128, or about $45 per ampere hour or 70 watt hour per dollar. And shipping time, I bought these, I believe at the end of November, and I received them at the beginning of January. So it was about two months. They arrived quicker than I thought they would. Now, these cells are B-grade cells. And as you can see in my overview, they are only bulk, voltage, and IR matched. And there's been lots of discussion about B-grade, A-grade, EV-grade, and things like that on the Off-Grid Garage channel, for instance. But I think I can explain things why and how and what the difference is if you want to use these in a energy storage solution. It's not so much about the cells themselves, but about the work you need to do with them. But that's a different video that I think is coming after this one, or maybe a video about the battery box. I'm not sure yet. But in a nutshell and the official info out there, the B grade means that they haven't passed Eve's internal testing of being EV grade, but in theory, they are still capable of holding 280 amp, 280 amp hour charge that they are rated for. To really be considered EV grade, they also need to adhere to stringent charge and discharge rates, which are much less important in home energy storage solutions with the currents as I outlined in my previous video. Remember, putting the cells in series changes the voltage of the total pack but does not change the amount of current that will be asked from the cells. Only linking them in parallel will change that number. So say we have a 50 volt pack and are drawing 25 amp. Each cell is delivering 25 amps individually. As outlined in the last video, generally you want to stay under 0.5 C charge. So with 280 amp hour cells, that's 140 amps for that cell or the complete battery. More than plenty for our purpose, and since we're going to be putting four packs in parallel, or four boxes, and you know, that will lower the amount of current each pack has to deliver on its own. Now, during the last part of this video, you've seen me unpack all the cells from their packaging. To finish off the video, let's take a more detailed look at how they were shipped. They come with two cells per carton, and they are packed in really dense and thick foam on all sides. I like opening them up from the bottom and then taking two cells out. Each of these carton weighs about 14 kilos, so that's quite hefty, but in my case, all 35 cartons made it shipped from China to the Netherlands unscathed. And that brings me to an important point. If you're going to do this yourself, be prepared for a lot of garbage. I happen to have a, a, a skip or whatever you call it uh, out front of the house, but otherwise it would have taken me multiple trips in my car to get rid of all the cardboard and all, especially all the foam that you get with the batteries. Cause you can't really compress much of the foam because the only empty space in those boxes, as, as I just showed you is where the batteries are. So the volume is actually the volume of that box minus the batteries, which you can't really compress. So, well, you saw that giant pile of batteries there. That is also the amount of waste foam and cardboard you're going to have. So 
make sure to take that into account because it's it's, it's a significant amount. And well, that kind of runs it up. You just saw me unpack about 62 kilowatt hours of battery cells, which in turn will be turned into four batteries of 14.3 kilowatts each for a total of about 57 kilowatt hour, or maybe slightly less. But as I mentioned, we'll be talking about that in a video soon, because although I believe buying B-grade B cells is fine, not everybody online will tell you what to watch out for when using them or buying them on the shop page. So I'll try and show you and explain to you as clearly as possible. Thanks for watching everyone. And uh, well, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.